Today we're gonna to break down stretching. I'm gonna discuss the three main types of stretching. When is it most effective to use each form? And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you a few of the extra benefits that I found while doing this research. And I was actually pretty shocked, so make sure you stay tuned to that. Pretty much just throwing at you everything you need to know about stretching, and let's get right into it. First off, thanks for clicking on the video. I appreciate you watching my content. I try to create new videos every week, so if you're not subscribed, you can uh, hit subscribe, or it might be, over, I think it's over there. Uh, so let's get right into the actual stretching content here. Most of the time when people talk about stretching, there's three main types. We have static, ballistic, and dynamic. Now the most commonly thought of is static, which is something like this here. When you go into a stretch position and you hold it for an extended period of time, roughly 30 to 60 seconds with the static stretch. So what's actually interesting with static stretching is this can actually reduce force production. So it's kind of an odd concept, but let me explain it here. When holding the stretch for an extended period of time, our GTOs, no, not that kind of GTO, this kind of a GTO, this is a Golgi tendon organ, a receptor found in the tendon that senses increases in tension and basically is like a safety mechanism that can reduce the muscle's ability to produce force. This reaction is essentially the muscle protecting itself when it recognizes it's in a vulnerable position. Definitely a marvel of the human body. Now the second type of stretching that's most common is ballistic stretching, which isn't as recommended anymore. In this stretch, we come to the end of our range of motion and we use a bouncing motion to increase tension on said muscle that we are stretching. If it looks a little bit more dangerous to you, you would be right. Ballistic stretching is associated with a higher risk of injury, so that is the reason why it's not as commonly recommended. And while doing the research here, I found a really great systematic review as linked in the description as always. And basically when looking at if this is a way to actually increase force production or reduce force production, it was a, a mixed bag of results and they concluded a firm conclusion cannot be drawn. So they concluded there's no conclusion. And our third form of stretching here is dynamic. This is what you see here, a dynamic stretch. This is also what you see a lot of professional athletes do on a field before a game. Unlike the other forms of stretching, dynamic is linked with increases in performance. In the systematic review I just mentioned earlier, when looking at dynamic stretching's effects on vertical leap, fast and slow dynamic stretching led to a 4.9% increase in the vertical leap. So it looks like dynamic stretching might be something that might be more applicable to functional movements or something that we're gonna do if we're about to play a sporting event. The overall percentage though, when you start calculating in force production is quite a bit lower at 1.3%, but it still does show an improvement. So does this mean static stretching is useless? I mean, it showed that it reduced force production, so that can't be helpful, but what's the reason it reduced force production? Well, if we really think about it, the reason it's reducing force production is because it's allowing that muscle to relax a little bit more. So could this be used to gain greater levels of range of motion in our joints? Well, yes, according to the systematic review, a greater number of studies reported greater range of motion when using PNF stretching compared to static stretching within a single session. What doesn't seem to be clear is the amount of range of motion you can actually increase simply due to the amount of variables. And to be fair, there are so many different things that go into this. You know, when you look at how long you're gonna do a stretching session for, are you gonna do 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? How intense are you actually stretching? So are you pushing down? Are you, are you going to the edge range of motion, just gently holding it? Or are you completely folding your body in half and really pushing hard through a stretch? And I'm not recommending either are better, but it's hard to quantify when you're, when you're really trying to put this into a study. So that seems like it's up in the air, but it does show there are improvements in range of motion. What is this PNF stretching I just discussed? It seems to show that when you look at force production, it's actually giving a larger decrease in force production. Does that mean it's helping relax that muscle a little bit more? Yes, technically it could. So PNF stretching or proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So that's a mouthful there. This is a technique you can use to improve the range of motion having a partner help you. So I'm gonna demonstrate this technique and here I have a client on the ground relaxed. And here in the situation, the trainer's gonna passively stretch the hamstring to the end of range of motion within a comfort zone. And I'm going to apply pressure and hold for about 30 seconds. I'm obviously not gonna hold for 30 seconds here. Now what I'll do is dial the stretch back just a little bit and I'm gonna have the client actually actively apply pressure 
onto my shoulder with their leg, which is gonna activate the hamstring in this situation. And they're gonna apply pressure for about 10 seconds. What I'll do is stretch that client back to the end of their range of motion. And normally you're gonna be able to increase that range of motion right away. This technique will actually use those GTOs we talked about earlier to help facilitate actual increases in range of motion. So this is definitely not recommended to do right before a lift. Let's say you were gonna do a deadlift. I definitely would not recommend doing this beforehand since it's already been shown to reduce force production. But something like this might be helpful on an off day or at the end of a workout to help increase those range of motions. Now, I recommend if you're gonna try this, use a professional, don't have your friend just start stretching your hamstring this way. Uh, it is a little bit higher risk of injury because you do have that person applying that pressure. You know, if they stumble into you or they don't really know what they're doing, they could hurt you. So just make sure you use someone that understands what they're doing. Now, when to use these types of stretching, I kind of mentioned it as we went, but dynamic stretching is gonna be before a sporting event. It's a great way to help with your warm up. And then when it comes to static stretching and PNF stretching, that's where I recommend doing something after your workout or even on an off day to help increase that range of motion. All right, I brought this up in the beginning. I wanna talk about some of the additional benefits you can actually gain from stretching. So let's get right into them. So stretching can actually reduce your arterial stiffness. So as we get older, our arteries can get stiff and rigid. And we can also improve our vascular function, which these two kind of go hand in hand. And in turn, this then will help reduce blood pressure. And in the study that I actually linked below uh, in the description, if you want to read it, it actually showed that these improvements were seen in the body parts of the, in the arteries of the body parts that were being stretched and not being stretched. There were improvements across the board. And one of the reasons this is, is because this is increasing the endothelial cell function. So endothelial cells actually release nitric oxide, which can help with the relaxation of our arteries. So when you think about it, it actually makes sense that you would see endothelial cell function improvements and artery stiffness improvements, improvements across the board in this area since they're so closely related. But I do wanna say that uh, this seems like there needs to be more research until this is 100% conclusive. So right now, this study that I brought up showed this as their findings, but as we know, science isn't just a consensus on one study. There needs to be more research, so just remember that going forward. Now, there's a lot of you probably thinking, how much do I need to stretch? How often? How much time? How long do I hold each stretch? Now, according to ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, that's kind of up to the individual and it's gonna be different based on per person. They do recommend two to three times a week, but they don't have a set amount of time. So when it comes to static stretching, they do recommend you hold that stretch between 30 seconds and 60 seconds. So this seems pretty consistent across the studies that I looked at. Um, but going forward, they don't conclude 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or anything like that. Uh, it is individual based. So I would recommend starting out with what feels comfortable, go maybe for five or 10 minutes, see how that is. Five minutes is better than no minutes. I think this is one of those things where when we add it into our training programs, a little bit of time is better than no time. And then 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, see how that is for you. If you're someone who's very, very tight, then you probably need more stretching than someone who's, who's you know, maybe a little tight in one or two areas that maybe need some more specific targeting. But one of the things I do wanna mention is some of the drawbacks from stretching. So we do already know that there's a reduced force production. So if you're going to be doing any type of power lifts, probably not a good idea to do any type of static stretching or PNF stretching before your actual lifts. But going forward, there's also other issues with stretching. If you're stretching too intensely, you have an increased risk of sprains, increased risk of tears or strains. Strains, strains, sprains, strains, sprains, or tears. So just remember that going into this, you don't have to get overly aggressive and you can also be over flexible. And in some cases, individuals who are too flexible have a higher risk of, of these types of injuries and actually hyperextending joint. Now, I really feel like most people don't have to worry about this. And one of the reasons we do see this happen can be due to a lack of musculature in that supporting joint and that can lead to instability. But like I said, I don't think most people have to worry about this. If you are concerned about this, talk to a trainer or maybe a physical therapist that can help you get on a stretching program. 
Some of my final thoughts here, I think everyone should be mixing in some form of stretching into their daily routine. Even if you're someone that's not even exercising, I think most of us don't mix in enough stretching. And as we get older, it seems like more and more people neglect stretching. So everyone watching, just think about this and some of the things I presented with you and mix in some stretching. It's simple enough, it's easy enough. You don't even have to go to the gym. You can do it at home while you're watching TV. All right, guys, so that's gonna be it for today's video. I hope you'd enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully everything you need to know about stretching. And if you're interested in more in-depth information here, I've linked all of my sources and give a click and read some of it. It's actually a really great systematic review I kept mentioning. Uh, they had a very extensive research and I definitely recommend reading it if you like reading stuff like that. Thanks for clicking on the video. Thanks for checking out Science Based Fitness. I'm Adam and we'll see you guys next time.